Welcome to this mini lecture where I'll discuss the concept of a professional digital identity, developing a professional learning network, which I'll refer to as a PLN, and ways in which you can build digital connectedness for professional outcomes. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri, Nangawal, Gundungara and Birupai peoples of Australia who are the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which CSU's campuses are located and pay respect to their elders, both past and present. I would also like to pay respects to the Turbal and Yangara people on whose land I am recording this video. I think it's important for you to know a little bit about me and how I've come to be presenting this mini lecture. My career in education began about 25 years ago as a primary school teacher, teaching year one. Over the years, I've had the privilege of teaching a diverse range of students from the youngest in prep to postgraduates. My career has involved various roles, classroom teacher, teacher librarian, deputy principal and learning designer. Fast forward to today, and I find myself the course director for the Master of Education in Teacher Librarianship at Charles Sturt University. But beyond all these roles, at heart, I am a researcher and most importantly, a lifelong learner. This passion for learning is why I'm a strong advocate for personal and professional learning networks. Through my own networks, I've gained invaluable insights and knowledge and I'd like to share this with others. My PhD research was driven by this passion for learning networks. I explored how school teachers experience professional growth through their personal learning networks online. I feel that we need to continue to expand our understanding of how we learn through networks, as many professionals, including teachers, teacher librarians, or what I'll, who I'll call TLs, and librarians, often rely on robust online networks due to the unique nature of their roles, and they're often working quite independently. So what will we discuss today? In this video, we'll discuss the concept of a professional digital identity and a professional or personal digital network. We'll also discuss why you might think about developing a PLN and the benefits of building connectedness for better digital and professional outcomes. Before we proceed, I think it's important for us to explore the differences between an online learning community and an online learning network. A lot of the time, learning communities and learning networks are treated as the same thing, and yet they're quite different. Whether it's online or offline, there are certain aspects that differentiate communities and networks. These features blur across these social structures, so the information below is not a set of hard and fast rules, but general features that have been identified of each. Generally, a learning community is formed intentionally by a group of people who know each other. This means they have strong ties, which is another way of saying they interact regularly and there's a level of trust between them. Because most members of a community will know each other, when one shares something in the group, it's more likely that this will be reciprocated and others will acknowledge this. The membership of the learning community is known. Even if members don't know each other well, there's generally a sense that everyone is working together towards a shared goal, such as the completion of a course or a task. There are several advantages of learning within a learning community. The most obvious is the sense of security, as members tend to know each other and they have a shared language and shared goals, so they're more likely to be supportive of each other. Also, knowing each other means that members tend to be mutually accountable to each other. The disadvantage of learning in a group like this is that it's possible to have an inward focus. Having a shared language and goals may become a reason for not accepting outside views. This can lead to an echo chamber chamber or homophily. Learning networks can include members of a community, but networks tend to be more organic, undefined and have both strong and weak ties. This means there'll be some members of the network who are known to each other and others who may be unknown. The membership of a network is far more flexible and usually changing all the time. The goals are personal to each individual and while members might work together, they may be working towards different goals. The advantage of this is that the network is there to meet your own personal needs by including diverse connections 
there is a greater chance of innovation and serendipitous discovery. Unfortunately, a network can include overwhelming amounts of information, which can make it difficult to find high quality learning in noisy channels. Also, learning through a network can be quite ambiguous as it's up to the individual to direct and set their own goals and achieve these goals. So why the digital focus? You might wonder why I'm emphasizing the digital aspect of online learning networks or learning networks, especially when you already have a network or group of colleagues that you meet regularly with in person. Physical in-person networks and groups have always been a cornerstone of informal learning. We've relied on our colleagues and our friends for advice to keep up to date with journals, conferences, and those day-to-day -day professional interactions. However, while these groups are crucial, they come with limitations. It's completely your choice to embrace or not to embrace digital social tools. I firmly believe it's a personal decision and not one that can be forced. However, it's important to be aware that opting out could potentially mean missing out on certain professional advantages. It's all about making informed choices, understanding the limitations of each approach and leveraging the advantages each approach offers. Digital networks transcend some of the barriers of face-to-face, -face, enabling connections with a broader professional community anytime and anywhere transcending time zones and geographical boundaries. For instance, I'm recording this in Brisbane, Queensland, while you could be listening from anywhere in the world at any time. This just wasn't possible in the days of fixed time, location bound university lectures. But let's not gloss over the challenges of social technologies. The landscape of social media is definitely not without its pitfalls and it's important to acknowledge them. From dis and misinformation to the impact on mental well-being, there are many negative aspects of engaging socially and professionally online. However, with a strategic and informed approach to particular platforms, the benefits can be substantial. Engaging with a wide array of professionals and accessing a vast repository of knowledge can enrich your professional journey. As we step into an era increasingly shaped by artificial intelligence and generated content, discerning quality information becomes even more crucial. In these times, a robust, critical and supportive network will be invaluable. It's not just about connecting, it's about building relationships that foster growth, learning and critical engagement with contents and ideas and this is why networks and groups both play an important part in your online professional digital learning experiences. This is where a strong, critical and supportive network is really super vital. The aim of this mini lecture is to inspire you to think about how we use different digital tools to connect with others and what might result. A well curated online learning network can be an invaluable resource in navigating the many challenges of 21st century living and embracing the opportunities of our digital age. Let's now consider our professional digital identity, which has three aspects. First is our digital footprint. Second, our social network identity. And finally, there are the capabilities, skills and knowledge that we use in order to navigate and interact with digital environments, which are our digital literacies. The first key element of our professional digital identity is our digital footprint. This term refers to the traces we leave on the internet as we interact with various websites like posting, sharing, commenting or uploading content. It's often likened to a digital tattoo given its lasting and somewhat permanent nature. As teacher librarians, we emphasize to students the importance of maintaining a professional or at least respectable digital footprint. It's a crucial part of digital citizenship. A simple guideline that we suggest for younger kids is to avoid sharing anything you wouldn't want your grandma to see. However, there's a part of our digital footprint that we can't control which Barbara and Marshall call the uncontainable self. 
This aspect exists even if you're not actively posting or liking anything online. It's formed by data collected about us as we move across the internet, sometimes through pixels embedded on websites we visit. For instance, The Guardian just recently reported on an investigation into TikTok's use of marketing pixels to track user information on various websites. This type of user information can include personal details like email addresses and phone numbers, even for non-TikTok users. While we can try to limit this uncontrollable aspect of our digital footprint by enhancing privacy settings and using ad blockers, complete control is virtually impossible. Our digital footprint shapes how algorithms identify us, track our online behavior, and personalize our web experiences. You can see how your digital footprint shapes your internet experience by comparing what you see online to what others do. Google customizes every search you do based upon your previous search activity. So when each of us searches even using the same search terms, Google will often provide a different result. Another time we can see evidence of our uncontainable self influencing our online experience is when we visit a shopping site and then suddenly all the ads on web pages and in Facebook are about products that we've been viewing on those other external sites. For more in-depth information, you can check out a blog post I've written on this topic, which is accessible via the QR code on this slide. It delves deeper into the nuances of digital footprints and their impact on our online identity. One intriguing activity you might not have tried yet is checking your digital footprint. While it's possible to see it completely, it's impossible to see it completely, a quick method is to see a glimpse by using a search engine. Many suggest Googling yourself regularly, which is effective, but comes with a caveat. Google tracks your online activity, so the results you see might be skewed by their algorithms to show you more favorable content. A more revealing approach is to use a privacy-focused search engine like DuckDuckGo, which doesn't track your activity. This means that your search results are more likely to be unbiased and could reveal surprising information. For instance, when I first tried this, I found an old feedback comment I'd left on a removalist's website years previously. It was a positive review, thank goodness, but it made me realize how such comments, even those made a long time ago, remain easily accessible online. Imagine if my feedback had been con con negative or contained harsh words. This highlights the importance of being mindful of what we post online. Additionally, photos where you appear uploaded by others without our knowledge can also serve us. This could be pictures where you're in the background or a main subject taken without your awareness. Knowing what's out there about you in the digital world is valuable. It can be eye-opening to see what aspects of your life and opinions are publicly accessible, shaping your digital footprint. Our social network identity describes how we might present ourselves differently in different online spaces and platforms. We might have one identity in Facebook, another identity in Instagram, and a different one altogether on Twitter or X. Most of us present ourselves differently in the digital environment, and even as we do in the real life world. For instance, I've always used Facebook primarily for family and friends. While I'm aware that many professionals use it for networking and joining groups related to their fields, most of the time I prefer to keep it personal. On the other hand, my previous approach on Twitter, now, more, um, now known as X, was more professional. I shared articles, insights on librarianship and information management, and kept my personal details to a minimum. Although I've stepped back from Twitter now, I used it to establish a professional persona. Currently, I'm increasing, increasingly using LinkedIn for professional networking, although it's not my preferred platform for this kind of sharing and connecting that I used to do on Twitter. While I'm also exploring platforms like Mastodon, Threads and Blue Sky, they haven't yet reached the level of engagement that really makes the whole experience rewarding. 
Just as an example, I also have an Instagram account which is dedicated solely to my dogs, Ruby and Alice. It's separate from my professional presence with no links to my other identity. It's all about my dogs. Not that I'm embarrassed or don't want people to know about my dogs. I've got no problem with that. But this is how I'm cultivating different spaces so that people can identify me through the different aspects of my personality and private and professional life. The lines between these identities can blur, which is known as a, uh, a phenomenon that Dana Boyd refers to as context collapse. This was particularly evident during the lockdowns with COVID, where our professional lives suddenly intruded on our personal spaces via Zoom meetings in our kitchens, with family members wandering past or pets making surprise appearances. The lockdowns give, gave us a great example of context collapse because our work and home lives unexpectedly merged. Some people argue that true authenticity online requires this blend to happen all the time. And while I understand this viewpoint, I believe that we naturally behave differently in various contexts. Just as we don't behave at work as we do at home, a certain degree of separation online can be very strategic and beneficial. Balancing the blend so you still appear human, are yet very professional in different spaces, is key to maintaining a distinct, appropriate persona in each space. Lastly, let's consider digital literacies. Digital literacies encompass much more than just the ability to navigate web-based technologies and social media. Digital literacy reflects our comfort, confidence and engagement with these platforms. It goes beyond understanding the mechanics. It's about knowing how to create relevant context, discern the appropriateness of information and effectively remix and redistribute this information or content. For example, we all might know someone who constantly forwards emails filled with jokes or random content. Their action isn't about their technical skill in using email, they can do that well. It's a reflection of their digital literacy. It demonstrates a lack of understanding that indiscriminately forwarding everything to their contact list isn't appropriate. This is a basic but very clear illustration of a level of digital literacy. Digital literacies involve a nuanced capability to make informed decisions about our actions on these platforms. It's about using tools effectively and consciously rather than being passively used by them. Of course, to some extent, being influenced by social media platforms is inevitable. It's part of their design. However, developing a strong sense of digital literacy helps us navigate these spaces more responsibly and effectively. The Personal Learning Network, or PLN, is an online network mediated by social technologies and strategically initiated by the individual. It encompasses the context of learning, the participants within the network, and the connections with people, information and resources which form the network. It's good to imagine having a personal learning network as a kind of superpower. It's about harnessing the ability to connect with diverse individuals all over the world, learning alongside them and from their experiences. Today, we're fortunate to have the technology to contact, with, contact others beyond just face-to-face -face interactions something that is unparalleled from any other era. One of the most exciting aspects of this is the opportunity to interact with professionals from a wide array of fields and disciplines. There's no need to confine our connections only to those within our immediate, immediate professional sphere, like information professionals, librarians or archivists. The potential for learning is vast and varied. For instance, in my network, there's a university professor in Paris who specialises in immunology and is deeply involved in developing new COVID vaccines. He also educates medical students in immunology. Despite our different fields, we've exchanged thoughts and had great discussions on digital curation tools and the dynamic nature of information literacy, especially in fast evolving fields like immunology, where information changes rapidly and needs to be organised for future reference because you just can't memorize it all anymore. 
This example illustrates why it's crucial not to limit your network. I encourage you to reach out, make new connections and embrace the learning opportunities they bring. You never know what you might discover, who you might meet and where these connections might lead you in your personal and professional journey. So keep your network open and dynamic. The PLN is essentially about learning. My research has found there are three different arenas of learning that can be accessed through the PLN. They do transcend occupational boundaries. Gone are the days when learning ended with formal education. Continuous professional development is now the norm and PLNs can play a crucial part in this. The first arena that I discovered was practice-based learning. Your PLN can be a valuable resource for addressing work-related queries, solving problems, and accessing latest resources and practices. It can be about daily problem solving and staying current, facilitated by a network of like-minded professionals or those in adjacent fields. The second arena is personal learning. This aspect involves understanding yourself within your profession which is especially important in roles where you might work in isolation like teaching or librarianship. It's about connecting with others in your field to gain broader perspectives on working conditions and experiences. This network can offer, some, offer you support on tough days, helping you feel less isolated and boosting your self-confidence, particularly when you're able to offer guidance to others. Lastly, the PLN offers opportunities for what I call public learning. Here, you get to share your professional practices and contribute to your field by creating and disseminating information. This helps build your online professional presence, gradually forming a portfolio of your work. Such visibility can lead to unique opportunities like invitations to speak at conferences or collaborate on projects. For instance, one of my blog posts on PLNs led to an invitation to Sweden to collaborate with learning designers, which was an incredible experience. However, navigating this public arena requires careful consideration. It's about balancing privacy with professional exposure, especially in controversial or sensitive fields. Digital literacy plays a crucial role here, helping you strategically develop your network and determine the extent of your public engagement. This approach is not a one size fits all. It's about making informed decisions based on your experiences and those of others. Leveraging a PLN wisely can immensely enrich your professional life, offering learning and growth opportunities that you might not otherwise experience. In this final section, let's talk about the process of developing a PLN Contrary to what some might think, creating a PLN isn't a one-time task that can be accomplished in a single afternoon. It's a gradual process, much like building a professional network at the start of your career in person. Developing a PLN involves cultivating digital literacy, establishing a social network identity, and maintaining a positive digital footprint. This combination enables you to confidently connect with others in the digital space. It's a common misconception, especially among undergraduate students, that you should wait until you have a job or something substantial to contribute before starting to build your PLN. In reality, the best time is to start during your studies. Everyone, regardless of their career stage, has valuable insights to offer, be it life experiences, fresh academic learning or new theories and research that those in the industry might not encounter as frequently. By beginning early in your career, you can develop a professional digital identity that enhances your employability. Even as a student, you can start building this identity and reputation by sharing your work and engaging with cutting edge research. It's a chance to demonstrate leadership and innovation. Often people underestimate their ability to contribute, thinking their insights could, might not be valuable. But the beauty of a PLN is that it values diverse perspectives and experiences. You'd be surprised at how much others can appreciate your unique contributions. Your PLN will continue to grow and change as you continue your career. 
Now is a great time to develop an online support network of colleagues, if you haven't already, who can provide you with professional support. By interacting with and sharing content online, you'll begin to develop your online professional digital identity, which may raise your professional reputation and give you a forum for sharing your strengths and talents. You may well experience opportunities which challenge and extend you as you connect across your field and even beyond your own areas of expertise. Leadership and innovation often arise from the cross fertilization, which can happen when connections are drawn from different areas, resulting in new and creative ways to solve problems. So as you step away from this video and have a bit of a think about what you've heard, consider these questions. What does it mean to you to become a connected professional? How do you work towards becoming a connected professional? And what might your PLN look like? Thanks so much for having this time with me and listening all the way to the end and very best wishes. I might see you one day in my PLN online and I really look forward to it.